In the chamber this week, we're getting a little meta with the history section and talking about the history of fandoms, convention, and fan culture, a battle of the Battle Royale, when a character leaves but the player stays, a completely random NPC, and Joe reports from Cleveland Comic Con. All this and more on Fandom Roulette. Oh, Manzi, I don't know what I did there at the end of that uh, introduction. Uh, hey, everyone. This is Joe. And this is your sick, sick, terrible leftover pasta that you've left in the back of your fridge for about a week, Cody. Oh, don't say, don't say that, Cody. <laughs> oh, Cody. Yeah, Cody's a sick boy, everyone. Apologies, apologies for uh, missing last week. As Cody was was very very sick, and one of my multiple jobs is kind of going a little crazy right now. But I'm not going to get into the details of that. Yeah, uh, what uh, nerdy stuff have you been up to, Cody? Well, one of them I will talk about in the video game section. But uh-huh. I saw Black Panther last night. Oh man, I still haven't seen it. It's really good. I recommend you go see it, and we'll talk about it. Uh- yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. next week, probably. I think <laughs> the plan is to see it over the weekend at some point. Hell yeah. Yeah, I mean, man, I've really wanted to, but my life has just been nonstop as of late, so... I, You know what? I understand. We'll talk about it. Yeah. We'll talk about it next week. Yeah, 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 for sure. Gotta, get, gotta stay topical, right? Right, so uh, what have you yeah. been up to? Well, one of the really busy things that I was up to this past weekend is something I will be talking about later, which is I gotta go to Comic Con in Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was super rad. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it in detail in that little last section that we like to do. But in terms of like the nerdy stuff that I've been doing in my like day to day I've started the Discworld book series, which I know is like a very long, engaging thing. And I'm still rolling with uh Star Trek. Still doing Star Trek. Very I'll cool. do Star Trek till the day I die, or I run out of Star Trek. Which <laughs> comes first. Um, but yeah, it's uh, been a pretty weird weekend, but in a good way. Nice. We're going to start off with a little bit of meta history, in that we're going to kind of be talking about the history of fandom. <gasps> oh my goodness. So yeah, fandom is kind of this word that has come to be known as like nebulous with the creation of fan culture and fan communities and you know it can be very very specific things uh so you have you know things like brown coats which is the term for the firefly fans or potterheads which is for harry potter or super whovians for like people who like supernatural or doctor who or there's a third one <laughs> super who lock Oh, and Sherlock. And then, you know, there's sometimes uh, weirder ones, too, that I'd like to throw out there. Did you know that there's technically a fandom? Because they're not wrong, which is Parrot Heads, which are fans of, like, Jimmy Buffett. Yeah. And, you know, arguably, one could even argue that Juggalos are their own kind of fandom. Oof. Um, yeah, which is, <laughs> of course, fans of the Insane Clown Posse. Uh, because, like I said, fandom is this kind of just nebulous term of a group of individuals who share a camaraderie uh, over a mutual love or a mutual respect of something uh, or a mutual fan of something. And, of course, you know, it's as intense as you'd like it to be. There are some people out there who, you know, maybe get a little too wrapped up in their fandoms or there are some people who might be casually on the fringe of a fandom. I, I know that, you know, we both claim that we are shallow dive fans in a lot of different things. Yeah. But, you know, we can still arguably be part of certain fandoms because we could talk ad nauseum with people about things that we both love, right? Oh, for sure. And so you're probably thinking to yourself, Joe, how could this possibly be history? That's silly. Like, you know, fandom's a new thing, right? Right, Cody? Right. Wrong. It's not a new thing. Uh, So there are people who have made very strong arguments that the idea of fandom is as old as Sherlock Holmes. And I'm not talking like the Benedict Cumberbatch television show Sherlock, although that is quite a popular fandom in you know our day and age. But I'm talking about the original short stories by Arthur Conan Doyle way back in the 1890s. So in 1893, 
uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle rather famously kills off Sherlock Holmes. What? Yeah. Did you ever watch the show Sherlock, Cody? I. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that. I just watched season four. Okay. Yeah, so I think I'm uh, caught up, like, in terms of Netflix. So, so you know how, uh, I think actually that's the end, so they say. Okay, okay. But you know the end of season two, the Reichenbach Falls, when Sherlock Holmes dies? Yes, yes. So that's actually based on a, a real short story that Arthur Conan Doyle wrote, where basically Sherlock is tussling with a guy, and he falls off the ledge, and he dies. And then, the end. Because... Arthur Conan Doyle famously hated Sherlock Holmes. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, he has a quote that I'm going to be paraphrasing, uh, and I'll find the actual quote at some point and post it, that it's something along the lines of, if the only thing I am remembered for is Sherlock Holmes, then I have been a failure of an author. Damn. Because, you know, he wrote other things. He wrote this, this rather famous book called The Lost World, which is paid homage to by the Lost World Jurassic Park, the the novel by Michael Crichton, and the movie by Steven Spielberg. But he wrote other things as well. It's just that Sherlock Holmes became immensely popular. As so you're saying to yourself, okay, Joe, so these are like, you know, short stories from back in the day. How is this possibly considered a fandom? People were so upset at the death of Sherlock Holmes that they started having public morning services. People would wear black armbands, they would gather in public parks to hold fake funerals for, you know, Sherlock Holmes, things like that. They began angrily writing to Conan Doyle and to The Strand, which is the magazine that these original short stories were published in. And after a while, they started writing stories of their own because they thought that they were going to be unsuccessful. So they start writing stories to one another about how they felt all their Sherlock Holmes mysteries would go. So these are fans writing fiction to be read by other fans. So they made fan Where fiction. Have we heard? Yeah, so it's really fan fiction, exactly. Uh, and this went on from about 1897 to 1902, more or less. And then after a while, due to pressure from all sides, Arthur Conan Doyle actually does end up bringing Sherlock back. Okay. Uh, and the explanation was that when he fell off the cliff, he just kind of grabbed onto a ledge and he stayed down there for a while and then he eventually got healthy and came back to London. Classic. Yeah. Obviously, there's kind of like ideas of fandom throughout probably arguably the world. Everyone for sure has their own favorite stories, this and that and the other thing. But you start to start seeing uh, fandom re-emerging in the 1930s with science fiction authors. And one of the very earliest kind of conventions is the World Science Fiction Convention since 1939, which I believe eventually is the thing that becomes Worldcon, which is where every year the Hugo Awards for the best achievements in sci-fi and fantasy happen every year. Neat. Yeah, so this is from the 1930s, right? And then we see another major shift happening again in the 1970s, after the cancellation of Star Trek. Uh, so Star Trek, of course, is a popular science fiction program that I know absolutely nothing about. It's not like I own multiple Star Trek things now that I'm done at Comic-Con or anything. I'm yeah, pretty I sure do. everyone's going to pause right now and then go back to the beginning of the episode where you said you're going to watch Star Trek until you die. And I'm still rolling with uh, Star Trek. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. These people, <laughs> they, they have nothing on me. I've never once lied on this pocket. No. Um, so, yeah, Star Trek was, you know, a, a very popular television program that got canceled for a lot of reasons. It was, it was very, very expensive. It was sort of a small group of fervent fans trying to save it, not necessarily, like, daily viewing for, you know, your average family or anything, or weekly viewing, I suppose. And then you start seeing Star Trek conventions specifically, where they would write fan fiction for another, one another, create fan movies on VHS and things like that, and distribute, you know, fan movies to one another, start writing specific fan magazines or fanzines that are going around to one another, and then, you know, I would argue that sort of fandom kind of reaches a fever pitch in our contemporary world. Okay. Because, and you know, maybe people will disagree with me, the internet has made it so much easier to join a fandom in this day and age. I mean, for sure. Look at us. I mean, our podcast is called Fandom Roulette. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, you have things like uh, Tumblr, yeah. which 
is basically, one might argue, an online convention 24-7 all the time. <laughs> you have websites like AO3, uh, which is archives of our own, and, and Wattpad and things like that. It's become so much easier to find fans of things you enjoy and engage with other fans of that thing. Whereas, like, you know, mad props to the Star Trek fans uh, of the 60s who were, like, like you know, making photocopies of their fan fictions, bringing them to conventions, and distributing them and trading them with their friends. That's hardcore. That is pretty hardcore. Or, like, mailing it to one another. Also, fun fact, these early Star Trek fans who did this uh, are primarily women, so respect... Ladies, thank you for kind of creating the modern day conception of fandom, I would argue. Yeah. And so this kind of lends itself to this idea of what I would almost argue is kind of like nerd mecca, which is comic cons. Uh, so, yeah, fan conventions or, or comic cons are terms that kind of date back to like the 1940s. Uh, as I said, we had earlier world you know, world science fiction cons or things like that, maybe going as far back as the 30s. But a convention, a, a con is, of course, just kind of fans of things meeting up together and discussing their mutual love of things and selling things to one another as well. So the most popular kinds of this is, of course, comic cons. And fun fact, at one point you were able to buy comic books at comic cons. <gasps> Can you not now? No, you can. Uh, it's just, <laughs> there's actually a really interesting documentary by uh, Morgan Spurlock, who's the guy who did the, like, Super Size Me movies. Okay. And he does a thing about uh, San Diego Comic-Con, where, you know, he, he talks to some comic sellers who say that, you know, in recent years it's become harder and harder to be a comic book seller at a Comic-Con, which I think is kind of like a fascinating concept, because Comic-Cons have sort of become, like, pop culture conventions in a way. And there's nothing wrong with that, I might add. It's a place where everyone can come together and enjoy themselves. Whereas, you know, back in the day, uh, there might be specific cons. You might have, like, a Star Trek con or, you know, a, uh, a role-playing con or things like that. Cons have kind of all melded to... Or comic cons have kind of just become sort of a blanket statement for uh, a fan convention. With one notable exception, I would argue... Which is, I know anime cons are their own very specific subset of things. Well, actually, I can actually I can talk about this subject. Yeah, jump on in. I've man. been I've been going to anime conventions since I was fifteen, and back then I actually went to the conventions and like went to the dealers' alley and you know go around and buy anime swag and wall scrolls and all that good stuff. Nice. But as I got older. It was just another reason to go to a hotel, get absolutely smashed, and then not think about the repercussions of that the next week, if you know what I mean. I, yeah, yeah. I, but, and, and there's, and I'm going to go back to a statement you made earlier. Now, you know, the big Comic Cons are kind of more focused on like pop culture stuff, you know, seeing your favorite stars and all that stuff, and like kind of convention panels to, you know, ask questions to the actors and actresses that play your favorite characters. But um, you also, at least um, at least in Ohio and a couple other nearby uh, states, there's a lot of, like, different conventions very specifically focused on certain things. So, like, you know, you've got your anime conventions. There's two, there's two big ones in Ohio that I can think of off the top of my head that I used to religiously go to, which is OhioCon and columbus ohio at the columbus convention center and then colossal con which has moved a bit but is more notably at the kalahari water resort in sandusky ohio yeah so we've gotten to a point or at least i've gotten to a point where i don't go anymore it's it's very expensive and you know maybe maybe down the road um when i don't feel so bad maybe we'll you and i will take a trip down uh at least for me memory lane but there's also um heck yeah like there's a whole con dedicated to twitch tv i know there's uh columbus gaming conventions um there's yeah. there's i mean granted they're always 
smaller in scope for the most part. I say that loosely because I'm sure there's a con out there that's super huge that is very focused. Like I'm thinking in, I think it's Baltimore. Don't quote me on that because I can't remember anymore. But I went to this huge anime convention called Otakon, and the dealer's room was basically a football field of different vendors trying to sell you anime swag. And it was just the craziest convention I'd ever been to. Sure. So many people dressed up in their favorite anime character outfits and stuff like that. It's They're fun. Uh, it's, yeah. It's a good time. And I mean, you know, uh, obviously uh, fan conventions are celebrations of fandoms. And it's, you know, this is something I'll talk about later. But, uh, you know, obviously every now and then a couple of rotten apples that spoiled a bunch but <laughs> it's just really cool to be in a room where it's pe- a lots of people excited about lots of things it's really just kind of fun to watch people excited about things but this is something i will expand upon later yeah. uh, needless to say uh i was really just kind of shocked to find out just how old fandom is as a concept because i think that it even sounds like a recent term you know yeah but to have sort of these precursors going back to, you know, Sherlock Holmes and things like that. Makes perfect sense in retrospect, but, you know, it's, it's just kind of interesting to see how old this concept uh, a fan is, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Any questions for me? I'm going to save them for the next bit, because I want to ask you how Cleveland, Cleveland Comic Con was. Oh, yeah, we'll get into it. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. get into it. All right, so I know you're not feeling, you know, your voice isn't super great, but do you want to jump in and uh, talk a little bit about your uh video game stuff so um recently i had just seen the increase in battle royale games so i figured with because it's been a fortnight since i've played fortnite (laughs) yeah that's a good one so (laughs) fortnite was a game that is in early access that came out about a little under a year ago I believe it technically came out for, like, early access, like, in July of last year. And it was originally a co-op sandbox survival game developed by a company called Epic Games, where... And another company called People Can Fly. And the idea was, like... I guess if you had to elevator pitch it, it was... What happens when you take Minecraft and Left 4 Dead and put them together in some kind of concoction? And, and you have Fortnite. And, that, and so over time, over the, over the course of the year, um, we see the rise in a game called Player Unknown Battlegrounds, which I've I think I've talked briefly about in another episode. Um, and so the concept of a battle royale is, if you are nerd savvy, it's I guess you're the closest like. Outside the video game medium would be like the Hunger Games, where Mm -hmm. you and a big group of people um, for PUBG and Fortnite, it's 100, get dropped on this big old island. And you scavenge the island for guns and supplies and the things that you'll need. And then as the game progresses, there's a circle that will slowly shrink uh, the battlefield. And if you're outside the circle, you'll take damage and you'll eventually die. But the concept is, like, you scavenge, you fight to survive, and then the battlefield will slowly shrink to a small little circle. And then, in the end, one person will be victorious. Or, in the case of, like, you know, they're team-based, like, whoever the last team is, is the winner. So, recently, I believe this was either earlier this week or late last week, uh, Fortnite jumped up in viewers on Twitch TV for higher than player unknown battlegrounds which for anyone who's unfamiliar with twitch there are i would say four or five games that consistently stay at the top of twitch Uh and that's counter-strike league of legends PUBG, and a couple others but fortnite just kind of bumped itself up out there above player unknown battlegrounds so i kind of wanted to briefly go over battle royale games in general and why i think I played Fortnite, so it's kind of the reason I bring it up, but Uh I wanted to talk about my experience with Fortnite and why I think it makes sense that Fortnite kind of took over, at least from uh, Twitch standards. So Fortnite um, came out 
roughly around a little after PUBG's like increase in fame. And um, so there's two versions of Fortnite. There's the there's that Minecraft Left for Dead mode where you go to cities and you gather resources and scavenge for supplies. And then there's kind of this horde mode finale where you have to fend off hordes of zombies from an objective. So once PUBG got popular, Epic Games and People Can Fly were like, hey, that's pretty cool. Why don't we put our spin on it? And so Fortnite releases their own version of Battle Royale, which is just called Fortnite. And then there's two versions. There's your Battle Royale and your single player. Now, people are like, well, well, what's the difference? Like, you know, they're the same genre. What makes them different? And I'll tell you, I have been playing PUBG on and off probably six, seven months-ish. I would say half of that in time that I've actually played with the game. I think I may have been carried to first place once. The rest of those games, I have been shot down like a damn dog. I just picked up Fortnite Battle Royale because, uh, and this is one of the key points in my opinion, the Battle Royale mode is free. You can go, like, if you wanted, Joe, you could go download it on your computer while we are recording and start playing. I think it's on Mac. Yeah. You could download the game right now and play the Battle Royale mode. No questions asked. That's crazy. So a couple of my buddies are like, dude, you got to get a trial Fortnite. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm kind of, I played, I played PUBG and it's like, I'm not good at it. It's not my game. Like I'll, I'll give it a shot. Why not? Uh So I played it for the two weekends. So while you were at Comic-Con, I played Fortnite in four days of not even hardcore playing. I think I played maybe four or five hours. I had won, Uh I had won two games. Nice. Yeah. And part of it could be because of my experience with PUBG, but I think I think there are specifically two really big reasons why I think Fortnite kind of took over in terms of like popularity on Twitch. And I've said Twitch a million times, and I don't think I've ever talked about it. Twitch.tv is a internet service, I guess you'd call it. It's free, uh-huh. where you can watch other people play video games when you can't play them. So I know that sounds silly, but it's it's a pretty big, big thing on the internet. Um, yeah. Especially with people who I can't mess. Nece- yeah, I I watch it pretty much. Uh, I wouldn't say every day, but pretty close to every day. Uh-huh. So like I I get the I get the popularity, and I think there are two reasons, and I'm kind of going along the back. You know, I'm taking a long road to get to my point. I, I like think there are to get to points. <laughs> There are two big factors why I think Fortnite is is killing it compared to PUBG or Player Unknown Battlegrounds. Better one weapons. No, actually, I think one, it's free. I think it's really okay. hard to beat free. Now, PUBG, you have to spend, I believe it's thirty, forty dollars to get Thanks. into that game. I know you can get it on Steam sales and what have you, but like uh, Fortnite is free, man. It's hard to beat free. I mean, they've got, the, they've got microtransactions and loot boxes, and I could get into that, I but... Pay, oh, I have to pay $10 for a new state state. No, god damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Call god, you're killing... My throat hurts from that. Um, no, you're... I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, it's free. You can go download it right now. Anyone who is like, oh, what's a Fortnite? What's a Battle Royale? If you want to know... Go download it. Epic Games, Fortnite, F-O-R-T-N-I-T-E. You can go download it right now. And even with their microtransactions and their cosmetics and all the stuff that usually drives me bonkers, it's like, but yeah, but the game's free. Like, I don't have to pay money on it, you know? And you can play the game and earn rewards. I mean, sure, you can boost that up with paying real money and all that stuff. But, you know, you know when you've got a... When, when your competitor is a $40 game that requires a high-spec computer to run at least okay, you know, it, it, it's, it's almost a no-brainer. And I then and then I think my second big point, which I'll, I'll touch on, is Fortnite has a easier skill curve than PUBG. And for people who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, most games have some kind of what I like to call the skill curve. 
and games either are easy to master, difficult to play, or just difficult to play outright. So there's kind of almost like a almost like a bell curve, I guess, of, okay, I'm learning how to play the game. Oh, I know how to do this thing. And then you, you know, you start to slowly learn all the mechanics. And then you get to a point where you're competent and that you don't need help to constantly, you know, do better at the game. All right. I can buy that. And I think, and, and part of Fortnite's accessibility is that I don't, I think the, so in shooters, it, there is a term that is loosely thrown around called bullet physics or what's the word I'm looking for? Bullet physics is fine. So like if you shoot a gun from a very far distance, that bullet will eventually drop or the farther the target is away from you, the less damage it does. There are certain physics and player unknown battlegrounds has this system that's supposed to feel almost real where like the guns have like like patterns in how they shoot. Like if you if you were to hold down the trigger of your favorite SMG, those bullets will fly in a, in a almost pattern that you have to master like to make sure that you're hitting your target. Whereas PUBG's mechanics and kind of bullet physics aren't so advanced, I guess okay. is the right word. So for me, it was so much easier to hit somebody in PUBG or I'm sorry, it was so much easier to hit somebody in Fortnite than it is in PUBG simply because the game does I think the I think Fortnite doesn't take itself too seriously. It's not one of those like Call of Duty dun, 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 dun. I got to be super hyper realistic with bullets and blood and all that stuff. Like Fortnite's kind of almost like a I don't know, it's like a Pixar game with guns. <laughs> How did you know the exact tagline for every Call of Duty game? Dude, I've been uh I've actually been researching the Call of Duty franchise for years and it's it's been truly, <laughs> truly, truly you are our video game expert. I am. I've been to know I've been... verbatim <laughs> the tagline for every Call of Duty game. Shoot <laughs> <laughs> shoot bullet. Oh, that's the God. new one. That's that's their working t- that's the that's... working one. <laughs> oh my god i need i need like one line and i'm a phd doctorate in call of duty history call of duty history uh, so it started off it was like your pretty standard world war ii shooter and then they're just like but what if laser guns and kevin spacey uh, yeah oh goodness so yeah, yeah no that's that's really interesting i'm sorry to go on that tangent there <laughs> no that was good i i loved it but yeah, I think yeah. I, I if you haven't played a Battle Royale game, but you like multiplayer games like Call of Duty, Counter-Strike, this uh-huh. is definitely a game to look at. I think the one thing that changed, like, so for a lot of people, uh, the thing that makes Fortnite so different besides its kind of more lighter attitude is that the building mechanics from the single player persist in the Battle Royale. Okay. So you can, you can scavenge trees and buildings and stuff for materials and... And while you're playing, you can build walls and build fortresses while things are going down. Whoa. And I think that's like one of the big key elements. And I think that's kind of the 2.5, not necessarily the third reason why I think Fortnite like has been beating it out because it's doing something different. But I think it's definitely adding to the experience is like being able to like, all right, I'm in the center of the circle with my buddy. We're going to make this huge superstructure and hang out on the top of it and snipe people while they all try to get to the center. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it's just adding a whole new level of how the game is played. So then you turn around and kill your buddy. Right. Okay. But yeah, I think that's my, my thing on... That's my video game section on Battle Royale games. If you haven't picked one up, check one out on Twitch TV. Uh, there's tons of people that play PUBG and Fortnite. And if you're looking to get into it, download Fortnite. It's free. Why not? I right? want have to do that. Yeah. So anyway, is it time for everyone's favorite part of every episode of the podcast? Absolutely. It's time for middle section. It's middle section of the show. It's where we talk about the place you can follow us. <laughs> so like that? That was a little bit of like a, a it was like a little peppy number there. I, I did enjoy that. I, uh... Yeah. It's definitely I a different, a different one every week until we like 
get legit, and they're like, no more middle section songs, and they'll be like, fight me. Who's they? They. Oh, shit. The corporate overlords that will eventually take us over? Is that who you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, when the Illuminati, like, comes in, they're like, hey, we need you to start sending secret Illuminati messages through your podcast because that's why that's why podcast exists you know oh wait you didn't get the memo for this week oh no 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 we're not that legit yet oh no i mean i've already gotten letters man wait what what never mind anyways let's talk about fandom roulette if you want to if you want to follow us on twitter and have joe talk about silly things on twitter you can follow us at fandom r underscore podcast that's our twitter handle do that um, okay. If you want to ask us questions, uh, occasionally we will do uh, questions from the audience and, uh, you know, specifically with like RPGs, uh, The I mean, every section really, but we have in the past talked about video games and history questions that we ask. It's part of our ongoing evolving podcast. You can send us an email at fanroulettepodcast at gmail.com if you are... If you're looking for a link to send to somebody, um, say, you know, oh, I like this episode. I think my buddy would like it. And then you want to send them over our way. We have a, a slew of episodes to catch up on. If this is your first episode, welcome. You can find us at www.fandomroulette.com. That's our website. That's where all of our stuff is going to be, all of our episodes, and any information coming uh, down the pipeline. Yeah. You can also find us on iTunes. Please feel free to rate and share us with your friends. And we are also on SoundCloud. All of these are accurate. Yeah. Our Facebook yeah. group is there. It's there. It's I close. technically lost half the bet that everyone wagered the last time we talked. Ha! However, I, only half. I'm a victorious man. <laughs> yeah. And, I'm uh, doing laps around my. I'm doing laps around my studio right now. Woo! I'm not actually doing laps. But anyway, middle section, middle section, middle section. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Who is that <laughs> over the hill? It's it's a boy. And we roll to my random. It's a garbage boy. It's a garbage boy. It's a garbage boy or girl. <laughs> you know that's like fair a sting at the end there yeah yeah i, I like that you are gender exclusive <laughs> or inclusive depending <laughs> on how you want to think about it <laughs> yeah well this yeah. week it is a boy Hooray! it I is a garbage right. boy i and, had a one uh, one third chance so it's uh, yeah that's true and uh you're gonna love this one oh, i'm so excited his name yes is talon grave doom <laughs> uh, and it's david's new character yes no so um, tell me about tell me about talon okay so before i get into his description for anyone who has no idea this is your first episode you have no idea what we're doing i make a npc or a character that you can use you the audience uh in your role-playing experiences i do we occasionally do heroes, villains. I'm looking into making, doing a little more uh, magical items, you know, magical things, you know, stuff to enhance your experience. So this week we have Talon Grave Doom, who is nice. a gnome cleric. Oh, sweet. That's a horrible name for a gnome. Yeah, right? So Talon was poor. God, Talon was born at a palace okay. and had a single father growing up. Oh, that's nice. Talon lived a poor lifestyle in a small house attached to a local palace. Never mind. <laughs> Not so nice anymore. He lived most of his childhood alone with no close friends. Oh, Talon. Is that why you became an edgelord, my man? <sighs> Maybe. Talon encountered a true servant of the gods and was so inspired that he immediately entered the service of a religious group. Oh, okay. Although Talon has always been devout, it wasn't until he completed his pilgrimage and saw his true calling. Oh. Talon is 18 years old and has only had one life event until this day. Okay. So, like, he, like, stayed inside a lot. We've all been there. Yeah. Talon was tempted with power by a devil. Since then, Talon has never been the same. Talon? 
I was rooting for you, bud. Dude, I rolled so good with this dude. I was just like, oh, yeah, yeah he's devout. He's amazing. And then all he's... of a sudden it was just like, he was tempted by a devil. Maybe oh, he God. was devout to the devil. <gasps> Maybe. Oh, man, I just wrote a good talent story right there. Hell yeah. Your talent fanfic. Yep. It's also, my send, send all your talent fanfic to fanrulepodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> Heck yeah, we'll read it on the. We'll read an episode of it. Oh god! <laughs> I promise, nothing yeah. too bad. Well, I mean, I would also be okay with something terrible. <laughs> no, don't, no, oh, I mean, like bad in the sense, like that we will read anything. Oh god! In our sexiest voices, when my voice is completely gone. Yeah, sexiest voices. Ooh. In a world. That's my sexy voice. That's why I'm single. Because <laughs> when I do my sexy voice, I go into my t- I go into my uh, my trailer voice. Well, you know what? Trailer voice a, can be a sexy voice. <laughs> in a world where we're both single, you should date me. Trailer voice, man. I don't know what's wrong with me tonight, my man. Oh, man. This is so good. I think so I've gone good. off the deep end. In a world... Where Joe keeps talking in the trailer voice. Trailer voice, boys. Trailer in in a world <laughs> where in a world where two friends talk about weird things on the talk about Talon on the internet. Talon was like, "Oh man, you guys, I'm so rock hard right now." Oh, and not God. because I'm a gnome. I mean, my penis. No. <laughs> I said, no bars hold, all fanfic. Oh, God. This is uh, this is fandom roulette after hours. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I like it. All right. So, anyway. Um, anyway. What, is, what kind of thing is... Ta- so, he's a gnome. Like, is he like a warlock? No, he's a cleric. So, he's a devout holy man, tempted by the devil. Oh, shit. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting character concept. Right? Which, what a beautiful segue into this new section, uh, or this right. RPG section we're going to be talking about today, uh, which I like to call, whoopsie, you need to make a new character. <laughs> so I can talk with like a little bit of authority on this front, because I did a whoopsie, I have to roll a new character myself. You did? Yeah, uh, well not so much whoopsie, but uh, it was for good pathos reasons. There's all kinds of different philosophies, I would argue, about playing RPGs and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and one of them is this idea of character kind of... God, what's the term for it, Cody? I'm character to... reshuffling, whatever. I know there's like an official term for it. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the idea that at some point there will be character deaths or character transitions because yeah. your choices matter. Yeah. Uh, and so I know, like, a lot of people, when they think about, like, RPGs, think about, like, oh, man, like, it's going to be, like, the Lord of the Rings, and we're going to have our little merry band of travelers, and we're going to be playing the same character for, like, ten years, and we're going to hit level 20, and then we're going to, like, create our own rules for continuing to level up for forever and forever and forever. And it was weird because all of them were named Boromir. And they were all named Boromir, and, uh... <laughs> <laughs> even even the female characters and it was called Bormir's it was called Bormir's very good day and and they went all around the world and they just had a really nice day they like they they shopped and but anyway yeah uh, <laughs> but you know sadly that's not always how it works out or uh sometimes people will have to leave games for whatever reason uh they might move their schedules might reach a a fever pitch where they're just unable to play anymore. Maybe they're just not into it as much anymore, things like that. Uh, And so in that case, you can do one of two things. You can either give your character a beautiful bon voyage and let them, you know, ride off into the distance, or you kill them. (laughs) Whichever is more pathos-y. Or sometimes you have the situation where a character wants to, like, retire, but the person still wants to play. Maybe they feel like their story has been told. Or maybe they dive through a portal after a hell demon man uh, and are now trapped on another plane of existence. Sounds like somebody I know. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm staring at you. You know who you are. Yeah. Whoa. How are you staring at him? This is an audio medium. I've broken the fifth wall. 
Oh God, the, the fifth <laughs> wall. That's yeah, so many walls. What house are you in that you have five walls in it? Um, wait, what house know, am I in that I have less than five walls? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Oh god, House of Leaves. But anyways. But I also think it's a good point to note that every table is going to be a little different. Yes. So my as, as a dungeon master, as a game master, I always like to put it on the table right away. Like if, if you're a fledgling DM and you want to have that gritty, real like campaign where death is permanent and real... Mm-hmm. And you know your your con- your choices have consequences and stuff like that. Just lay that on the table. Session one, Everyone be like, "Hey, like what?" Oh, sorry. You were making a really good point. <laughs> but no, I lay it out on the table when the game starts. Tell your people, and I do this with my current campaign with Joe. Anytime we get to a section where I'm like, you know what, I think one of them's going to eat it. I'll let them know, hey. Your, you know, your choices have consequences, and if you, if you fuck up, and you die, like that's it. Now, granted, you guys are at a point in the game where you could drag somebody's body and try to resurrect them and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But even when you guys first started, I, I warned you, like there is a chance that you'll die. It mm-hmm. and you know, I think I think there's doing that, and I personally, granted. None of your character, besides besides our current character who has flung his soul into another dimension. I won't name his name right here. Yeah. But if anyone if anyone dies, I'd rather it go out with like a bang than a whimper. I agree. So like, and I, and I can see it from both sides. I know character or players get attached to their character, especially if you've been playing them for a really long time. And I think I think that's a val it's a valid point that you know some campaigns may never have those player death experiences or I'm sorry character death experiences. Hopefully, no game ever has a player death experience. That would be unfortunate. I would argue that would be unfortunate. But if but if a character dies, I think they should you know a, as a DM, they either go out with some kind of bang and be like, well, my character's dying, but I want him to you know, hold off the the enemy so that my friends can flee. Or yep. maybe he wants to have that, like, final, like, I'm bleeding out, but I want to tell them that, you know, I have, you know, I have unfinished business or whatever. Or maybe they um, land that final blow on the big boss. Right. And, and then they die afterwards. Like, as, as a dungeon master... I implore all of those who want to have that gritty, real, death is permanent experience to remember that your players, for the most part, have put a lot of time and energy into these characters, whether it comes to character voices or their motivations or just the time spent jotting down notes about the campaign and how that affects them. Yep. Give them something. Don't... I think I think the worst thing, in my personal opinion, the worst thing you can do is have some mediocre enemy kill a character and not have any kind of finish. Like, if a, if a random kobold, which is, you know, a, a small little dragon person, comes up and knocks you out and you're dead, and it's like, well, that's it. Let's move on. Like, that sucks. Like, I can see that from both sides. Like, yep. So, yeah, as a DM, I implore you to give it some thought. You don't necessarily have to do what I do. But give it some thought that, you know, oftentimes characters are made and people put, you know, sometimes they'll put their hearts and souls into it. And, you know, ideally, to kind of go off of that that idea, we've talked about this before, and this isn't always in a commonality, but I think D&D is a, a thing best shared with friends. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, when it comes to things like character creation and character death and things like that, just keep in mind, it's like playing a game with your friends. So if you don't want a friend, to, you know, if, if it's a friend who might get mad at you or something for killing them off, just keep that in mind and don't try to act all upset if they're, you know, offended by the fact that you may have cuddled off their character or something like that. Especially if you don't give them that, like, really cool crescendo death, you know? Yeah. And I think it's also worth noting that especially if it's, like, your friends and, you know, they're they're upset, maybe, you know, give them a, give them a eulogy or... 
yeah. you know, maybe maybe afterwards, like, hey, let's go out to the bar. I'll buy you a drink. You know, like that was rough. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. Just keep it in mind when uh, you implore character deaths. Now, I know that's not every table. Not every table is going to have, you know, it might be like Lord of the Rings and everybody's playing a character that doesn't die. But, you know, especially or with... Maybe... Go on. Oh. Or maybe, you know, a character, like, maybe uh, your players are super into the concept of it. Like, they watched the first season of Game of Thrones and were really excited when the, you know, uh, spoilers, I guess it's so old, spoilers, uh, when, you know, the presumably protagonist of the show dies. Maybe they were really excited by that and they wanted a world like that where anything was possible. Right, yeah. No, it's definitely, and that's why... I will always say when we talk about RPGs, a session zero where you talk about your expectations of the game, this is definitely one of them. This is like, in my opinion, crucial to let people know what kind of game you're playing. I know nowadays if I ever have a new character or we're getting to a new arc, I let you guys know that I am not afraid to put you in a situation where you might die. Yep. So... Something to consider. All right. And then on to the last little section. Yeah. Tell me, and this is my question from before, how was Cleveland Comic Con? So, yeah, uh, this weekend I had the opportunity to go to Cleveland Comic Con for basically, no, for free, thanks to a mutual friend who had a booth at Cleveland Comic Con. Nice. Uh, I will tell you, her. the name of her company is the McBath Soap. You can find her on Etsy, and she has various fandom soaps up there. Cool. And so, yeah, uh, she asked me and another friend if we could help her out uh, at the booth. And this was my very first con, like, ever. That's I've super never... awesome. Yeah. Uh, and so I've heard that it was kind of smaller than it has been in years past, and I was never expecting Cleveland Comic Con to be, like, a gigantic thing or anything like that. But apparently this weekend, there was also the Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle, which is a very big con. Okay. Uh, So it's possible that we might have lost some people, you know, to that. But uh, it was one of the most fascinating experiences of my entire life. We were, we spent the majority of our time in the vendor side of things, and she was very nice and gave us lots of time to wander around and go to any panels that we might go to we might enjoy going to, and I can talk about that in a minute. But it was just fascinating to wander around and look at all of the beautiful merchandise that people can buy. Oh, for sure. I love the vendor's alley or vendor's corner, whatever you want to call it. It's always so much fun. Half of my bookcase at home is filled with stuff that I got from conventions. Uh, And, like, some some notable ones that stand out in my mind, we actually became pretty... uh, we, We became rather familiar with um, an artist whose art was called Group Hugs, which is various characters from various fandoms just hugging each other. That's adorable. Yeah, so I got one of Chewbacca and Han Solo hugging each other. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah, and Toothless the Dragon and Hiccup from How to Train Your Dragon hugging each other. Yeah. They had uh, Stranger Things kids hugging each other, and then in the Upside Down, uh, it was Will and Barb hugging each other. Yeah. We had, uh, there was this guy who made this amazing art on, on metal sheets that looked really cool under, like, uh, rainbow-colored lights. Obviously, there were, like, a million Funko Pop stands. Sure. And then, in the artist's alley, there was Tom Zoller, who writes for the My Little Pony comic. The guy literally right across the street, or the way from us, was one of the animators on Gargoyles, the old Disney TV show. That's dope. Yeah, he was really cool, too. And then he also worked for Marvel and DC and, you know, Image and Dark Horse and things like that. So he had basically any character that you could think of, he had it there. We had, you know, people selling die cuts from wood machines, and that was pretty cool. Uh, Some of the notable celebrities that were at the Cleveland Comic Con were uh, Nichelle Nichols, who was Lieutenant Uhura on... The original Star Trek. Very cool. John Barrowman, who was Malcolm Merlin on Arrow, and then I know he was a character on Doctor Who, but I don't remember his name right now. Captain Jack, right? Oh, yeah, Captain Jack Harkness. Yeah, Jack Harkness. 
Um, I think that's his name. I could be wrong, though. Yeah. Uh, who else? Uh, David Tennant was there on Sunday. Oh, yeah, so was uh, Billy Piper, wasn't she? And Billy Piper, yes. I was actually just about to say that. Um, Very cool. So that was their big Sunday event, was they had uh, a talk with David Tennant and Billy Piper. The sort of the biggest name celebrity, I would say, they had there was Ezra Miller, who was uh, the Flash in the Justice League movie. Okay, okay. Who actually came by the stand when my friend and I weren't there, and the other, the purveyor of the stand didn't know it was him. So, oh, no. Right? I wish I was there, because like I would have just been my normal self, and then probably realized about halfway through my pitch that it was Ezra Miller, and then probably freaked out. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean... And then, so, it seems to me like the majority of the panels, at least with the Cleveland Comic Con, and like I said, this was my first con, so I can't really comment on it for anyone else. A lot of it was, like, cosplay-related. Yeah, yeah. Cosplay is huge in all those things. Yes. Uh, and so, like, they had special classes, like, cosplaying on a budget, which I'll talk about in just a second. I've um, actually also cosplayed a lot in my you youth. have? Yeah. What were some of your characters? I think my first notable one, like, I got... I don't want to say internet famous, that seems a little pretentious, but I was uh-huh. on 4chan's cosplay page for a while. I was a Team oh, Aqua solid. member back when Team Aqua was still relatively new. That's um, awesome, my man. I also did Team Rocket with my friends. I played, or I played, I cosplayed a character from The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, so it was kind of just a you know schoolboy outfit. Uh-huh. and a Pokemon gym leader at some point. I can't remember his name anymore. He was one of the electric types from later games. And, uh, yeah, no, I've, well, I've cosplayed a lot. I did some cosplaying as well. Nice. I saw that. It was really funny. I liked it. Yeah. Uh, so my my best friend and I uh, wanted to cosplay on, on Sunday, and we wanted a cosplay that we could throw together very, very quickly. And so we remembered that there was this uh, amazing little short from the Homestar Runner website. Yeah. That was a, so we had enough people recognize us, but I once had to explain that my character was a spinoff of a spinoff of a spinoff. <laughs> and the guy just kind of gave me this dead eye look. And I was like, yep, I'm going to keep moving now. But this is amazing. Uh, there was this amazing comic on there called Four Gregs. Nice. Uh, not one, not two, not three, not five, but Four Gregs. And it's this uh, parody of just about the worst nerds you can think of. <laughs> so it's it's sci-fi Greg, D&D Greg, open source Greg, and then Japanese culture Greg. Oh, God. And if you just like do a quick Google search... Uh, they're just dudes wearing white t-shirts that have their names scrawled on them in very poor font, kind of diagonally. Because in the logic of it, it's one of the characters from Homestar Runner drawing a comic making fun of nerds. <laughs> uh, so we dressed up as Sci-Fi Greg and D&D Greg. And uh, if you ever look up, the, they, they sound, I'm going to give you a pitch perfect for Greg's. Because uh, they all sound basically just like this. So it's like, Shields up, everyone. Welcome to our fair village. We're going to go to a place where football players cannot beat us up. <laughs> uh, and so we wandered around. About five people knew who we were. Nice. And nice. it was really exciting. But one of those people who knew where we were is actually a voice actor for the Attack on Titan dub whose name I'm going to look up right now is Jessica Cavello, I think her name is. Okay, okay. Not only did she recognize us, she took our picture, which, let me tell you, was pretty flattering. That's really cool. But, yeah, like, as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the fandom thing, it was just super amazing to just watch all of these people, like, just have so much fun. Um, Hell yeah. It was, it was just, I I was commenting to one of my friends at the close of the weekend as we were breaking everything down and getting ready to pack it all up, that it was about as therapeutic as a vacation. Uh, Yeah. And I realized the reason was I had spent basically 48 complete hours away from the world. I wasn't on, you know, Facebook 
I wasn't watching people getting angry at each other. I was watching, you know, people walking around in costumes, asking each other if they could take pictures, buying, you know, you know, things like that, you know, supporting each other, having conversations, just lots of laughter. And I know that it might sound like a, a strange or a sappy thing, but I think at the end of the day, that's the real power of, like, fandom and fan culture. I can uh, take it. I'm going to get a little sappy here for a second. Oh, boy. Obviously, like, I don't advocate turning yourself off from the world or ignoring the world in general. Stay informed. Pay attention to things that are going on. Obviously, fight to make the world a better place. But there's something special in watching, you know, watching people unabashedly enjoy something. And like I oh, said, yeah. you know, Comic-Con wasn't a, a perfect place. There were some people who were not, you know, who were actually characters like the Four Gregs or, you know, people who were not the coolest people in the entire world. But there's something special about just kind of letting yourself fully enjoy something for even a couple of hours. I get it. And, you know, it was, it was just really special, especially because... I had been needing, like, a break from the world, and basically two full days, you know, two and a half days, I was surrounded by people who were just loving things and getting super excited and dressing up as characters, and sometimes the most fun thing was just to stand behind the booth and try to guess what the cosplays were that were walking by. Oh, God, I can't tell you. It, that might be one of my favorite things, is to just look at all the cosplayers. And it was incredible. It, I'll 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 talk. I'll tell you uh, two or three of my favorite ones, and I think we Hell can wrap yeah. up the show on that. So there was an amazing Joker and Harley Quinn gender swap cosplay, where nice, they were nice. in. Uh, but they were also in like Harlequin style, like carnival costumes. Oh, that's really cool. I like that. Yeah. So they had like domino masks and flowing dresses, and and he was in like a harlequin suit then there was an amazing there was an amazing nazgul cosplayer okay with the amazing gloves and the like the sword the fell sword there was this adorable family that was cosplaying as star wars so they had a kylo ren they had a leia they had a ray she had a little bb8 and then they had a little baby in a stroller and the stroller had uh at at legs and a head on it that's adorable it was, it was wonderful. Let me tell you something. Every time I saw a little Ray walk by, or even an older Ray, but every time I saw a Ray cosplayer, I got really, really happy. Nice. Nice. It was, it was really exciting to just, like, watch all these, like, little kids so enthusiastic about a character, especially, like, a positive female character in that sense. And then, Hell probably yeah. my number one from the weekend, there was a guy who looked like, uh, basically, it was Star Trek captain of, like, a Master and Commander boat. So okay. he had, like, a long frock coat and a and a tricorner hat with the Federation logo on it. It was really cool. Very cool, very cool. And uh, as, when we hang out next time we see each other, uh, ask me to see my swag. I will probably have it with me, so. Yes, I love swag. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna... Yes. Oh, go on, go on. Oh yeah, no, go ahead, man. Well, I was gonna. I have a feeling we're we're gonna be wrapping up soon. Yeah. So I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave the world with two bits of knowledge that I don't think a lot of people know. Okay. So, uh, first one is my first ever cosplay, <laughs> which I believe was my second con. I cosplayed like pre time skip Naruto. Okay. So, you know, spiky hair, I had the jacket, I had everything. It was pretty funny. And and then that second one, I used to be able to do the full intro dance to Melancho Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, if anyone knows that anime. It's kind of old now, I think. Uh-huh. So, yeah, those are the two little two little anime. I was I was a big old anime nerd when I was younger. <laughs> I mean, I still am, but like I'm I was a huge anime nerd. Yeah. So yeah, that's well, that a sounds, little bit of great. information. Yeah, yeah. We, we we definitely need to like down the road. We should definitely go visit some cons. Go back to my, oh. go back to my old stomping grounds and have a good time. I agree. It was it was 
amazing and a lot of fun. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, wrapping up, uh, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of Fandom Roulette. As always, follow us on all the things we'll be mentioned in our middle section. And we have some big news to mention in the next maybe episode or two. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, signing off, I'm Joe. And I'm your sick, Cody. I'm dying. And as always, stay nerdy. <laughs> stay super nerdy. Stay super nerdy.